the origins of Chicano studies. This information is taken from the textbook Chicano o Studies Survey and Analysis by Bixler, Marquez, and Ortega. Roman numeral one, introduction. The field of Chicano studies was formed during the historically troubled decade of the 1960s. When we say troubled decade, the 1960s are historical because we've got the civil rights movement, we've got a war in Vietnam that the American public was very much against. Um, and we've got the first kind of um, awareness of the injustice that minorities are facing. And so the 60s had a lot going on. We had JFK, a much beloved president who was assassinated early in the decade. So we've got a lot going on that kind of uh, fuels this new movement for equality. And in this case, Chicano studies. Issues such as race, inequality, opportunities in education and work, health, inclusion and the war in Vietnam motivated groups throughout the country to question their social status and that of the dominant elites. You can guess who the dominant elites are. Those are going to be typically uh, white folks, usually of old money, right, passed down generation to generation. Chicano studies movement originated in California due to the large Mexican population. The Chicano studies student movement in universities waged constant struggles to have their own programs. If you can imagine going to a college where they don't even acknowledge your ethnicity as um, worthy of being studied, right? That kind of calls into question, what am I learning and why? Roman numeral two, politics. Chicano students were involved with politically minded organizations. Here are just a few. The United Mexican American Students, or UMass, Mexican American Youth Organization, MAYO, Mexican American Student Council, oops, I'm missing that one, that's M-A-S-C, and Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Aslan, Mecha. Politics continued. So before the 1960s, there were few Chicanos enrolled in universities and fewer Chicano intellectuals with professional standing uh, with teaching and publishing, right? So we have few Chicanos attending college and then we have fewer in positions of authority at these universities. Hey, same idea. If you're going to a university and you don't see anyone in authority who looks like you, it kind of makes it have that um, us versus them or other feeling. The few Chicanos who were in college came from a small middle class group. They received financial assistance from the Catholic and Protestant churches as well as the YMCA. In the 1960s, college students found they had no intellectual tradition with a distinct Mexican focus. This intellectual tradition means specifically at the universities, okay? So of course they have their own intellectual traditions at home, but in the universities, they don't have intellectual traditions where they can take a Mexican studies class or they can take a Chicano studies class. Um, it just wasn't a thing back then. And so the 60s really kind of starts that ball rolling to try to um, right some of these wrongs in higher education. Throughout the 1960s, many Mexicans grew in prominence in major universities across the country. So we've got um, intellectuals growing, they're getting hired at the universities, they're publishing, they're starting their own um, 
uh, journals, intellectual journals. Um, so as the 60s came to a close, we have a second generation or a second wave of uh, Chicano students who come to the universities and they look back at the first generation scholars and they're like, mm -mm, you're too traditional, you're too academic, and you're too removed from the needs of the community. It kind of has that sellout feel. So the, the second generation is looking at that first generation of um, Chicano intellectuals saying, you started us off, but you didn't get there, that you didn't go far enough and you didn't get there fast enough. So we're gonna take over and we're gonna run and be a little bit more aggressive. For example, they rejected assimilation and integrationist ideas and instead embraced a strong Mexican identity and any other form of expression that they felt moved to embrace. Okay, so rejecting assimilation, right? We're not trying to become part of the American culture. We're proud of who we are and we want to hold on to our heritage because it is worth holding on to despite what uh, mainstream American culture had said for, for decades was lose your own culture, become American as fast as possible. For the Chicano movement, it was important to embrace and understand exactly where the individuals are from. Key point here, we're looking at them culturally, not necessarily geographically. So people can be from different areas in, um, in Spanish speaking countries, um, but culturally we're looking for those similarities. the numeral three, cultural nationalism. Nationalism called for the re rejection of assimilation. Schools had used corporal punishment, that's where they would smack your hands with a ruler or, or paddle your bottom, for speaking Spanish. Little or nothing about the Mexican community was uh, found in textbooks. And a history of putting down Mexican culture led many Mexican Americans to reject their own culture um, and believe that they really were Americans. So because they were pushed to reject their, um, I'll say true culture, that's really led to a confusion of identity, right? I look a certain way, I speak a certain way, but I'm not allowed to embrace that part of who I am. So we've got a lot of cultural confusion here. For this and for many other reasons, the Chicano movement believed it necessary to push cultural nationalism as a way to get its members reacquainted with Mexican heritage. And this is where the Chicano Studies movement begins. It's not just about cultural nationalism. The radicalism of the period was influenced by the social and political issues of the time, such as extreme poverty, civil rights or lack thereof, political and economic inequality, racism, and again, that war in Vietnam, which is driving the youth activists into politics of change, right? They don't want this war. They don't want to be drafted into it. Um, and so we've got these people who might not normally be so politically charged, but when you put all of these variables together, especially poverty and racism um, and other forms of economic inequality, you've got a very charged group of people who are now interested in politics of change and are coming out in large numbers to support it. Chicano youth called for changes at the college level, so we have two focuses here. They demanded to be taught about their culture and history, and they wanted training and knowledge to be um, allow them to be change makers in their communities. It's not just enough to learn about it, but how can I improve my situation and those of people who have the same culture as I do? So the student efforts and pressure led to the first Chicano Studies program in 1968 at the California State College in Los Angeles. Within the next few years, more and more universities adopted such programs, starting in the West and then moving eastward.
student efforts and pressure led to the first Chicano Studies program um, in Los Angeles. Sorry, I read that. Big, big bullet point at the bottom. Programs were met with varying degrees of success. You can imagine that um, if the university leadership is not really on board with this, then the program might fizzle out or not be very good. Another example would be the quality of professors and the curriculum. Do you have people who want to teach Chicano studies or are you assigning them this as part of their job? Right? And then their relationship with the Chicano community. Of course, in order for it to be an authentic learning experience, the Chicano community has to support it. So the call for self-determination of the community and the term Chicano becomes the source of a new cultural identity. Now this is back in the 60s, so um, the term has gone through many evolutions of acceptability, not acceptability, you know, based on the different cultures within this Chicano uh, title. But at least at this point uh, in the text, we're looking at it as a new unifying term um, for this cultural identity for people of Mexican uh, American descent. So in these programs, um, they focused on language, education, literature, creative arts, folklore, philosophy, and then ideology, which is just like a, a system of beliefs to the objective conditions of its historical, social, cultural, even psychological political and economic socialization, as well as development and existence. Those last two are kind of really broad ideas, right? Like the development of the Chicano man or woman, and then the existence of the culture, essentially acknowledging that it exists, that it cannot be shoved into a corner or made to um, be non-existent because you've assimilated, right? The existence is in and of itself an important feature of the Chicano studies program. And last, in the words of Jose Cuellar, Chicano Studies was originally conceived as a part of a people's struggle for equality and justice, and as a means to meet the growing need for accurate analysis of the strategic needs, progress, development, and self-determination of the Mexican community in the United States. <laughs>